reading today comes from the book of uh, Philippians, a few verses from the beginning and uh, then a few verses from the end. So a few verses from chapter one and then a few verses from chapter four. <clears throat> I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in respect to giving and receiving, except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid again and again when I was in need. Not that I'm looking for a gift, for I am looking for what may be credited to your account. I have received full payment and even more. I am amply supplied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gift you sent. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Good morning, everyone. It's uh, such a joy for Jane and myself to be here with you back at St. Peter's. Thank you for your welcome, Rachel. It's so lovely to be here. Uh, so thank you very much indeed. We're going to begin by hearing a bit more Malagasy music. Very brief. <laughs> so, as you probably know, we were working as CMS mission partners in Madagascar for, for nearly three years until June. And we appreciated the exuberance of the Malagasy singing in worship. And we'd like to share from our experience. And we're basing our talk today on Paul's letter to the Philippians. And we would encourage you to read it at home afterwards. In Philippians chapter 1, verses 3 to 5, we heard that Paul thanks God for his brothers and sisters in Philippi, and especially for their partnership with him in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we want to thank you too for your partnership with us over these past years when we've been in South Sudan and then in Madagascar. Especially we thank you from our hearts for your prayers that have sustained us by the Spirit of God. So we're most grateful. Then in chapter 4, Paul goes on to say in verses 15 and 16 that he thanks the Philippian church for their financial gifts for his ministry. They were the only church that supported him. And we are most grateful to you too for the way you've given uh, towards our work. Paul describes their gift as a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. That's how we feel about your gift to us too. And we know that, hard, that times are very hard financially for churches in this country. So your commitment to mission has been I think especially profound and wonderful and selfless. And God has a promise for you in chapter 4, verse 19. He will fully satisfy every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. So a very big thank you for your support for us. 
We also wanted to thank you for the special Lent gift, which we spent on providing mosquito netting for many of the buildings on the compound to help prevent people catching malaria, uh, for planting trees to help the environment, and for the new kitchen. It took some time because things happen slowly in Madagascar. Yeah, they happen very slowly. We want to also thank God, not just for you, but we want to thank God for the privilege that we've had in making disciples in Madagascar. Because making disciples is nothing new. Paul was a great disciple maker, though he didn't necessarily use those words. He loved the church at Philippi, the people there, the Christians, with the love of Christ. And so he longed that they might know Christ as he knew Christ, and that they might imitate Christ as he imitated Christ. So he says in chapter 1, live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus. And in chapter 2, he calls them to a life of holiness and unity, so that their lives shine like stars in the world. That's what he wants of us, and that's what he wants us to encourage in other people. Making disciples has been at the heart of the church's calling right from the beginning. It was Paul's great passion to ask you, is it your passion too, to be a disciple, to follow Jesus, and to make disciples? So let us tell you a little bit about the context for making disciples. So Madagascar is off the coast of Africa in the Indian Ocean, and it's about the area of France, but it's a very long, thin island, as you can see. It's a very diverse, beautiful land. So there are mountains and beaches, lush rainforests, and very dry, spiny forests with tall cacti down in the south. And because it's an island, it has many unique animals and plants. So what are these? Emus. Emus. And it also has these trees, which are baobabs. Thank you, Joan. <laughs> but is it African? In fact, the first inhabitants crossed from Southeast Asia, bringing their language and culture. And the people are quite a mix. Some look Asian, some look African. And the other thing about Madagascar is it's very poor, especially in the south where we were. In 2006, Todd McGregor, an American missionary, was appointed Bishop of Tuliar Diocese. And with a Malagasy team, he began planting churches across the south of Madagascar. And it was quite a challenge in a diocese the size of England and Wales put together. And very few paved roads, but churches grew, and there are now about 100. So Tuliar Diocese is that salmon pink area in the south and southwest. By the time we arrived in 2017, it was clear there was a need for the people's faith, these new Christians' faith, to be deepened. And so to meet this need, Bishop Todd asked us to use a course called Rooted in Jesus. It's a discipleship program that was designed for Africa. It was developed by a Tanzanian bishop and a UK minister, and it's now widely used across Africa. The course consists of 48 lessons in discipleship. Uh, titles include things like, who is Jesus? And more practical things like, should Christians drink alcohol? It works through small groups of up to 12 people meeting weekly with a leader. And our task was to train leaders of these discipleship groups. A local assistant, the Reverend Flora, a, a dear, dear friend of ours, was appointed in 2018. And 2018 and 19, Jane, Flora, and I 
ran training programs for Rooted in Jesus groups in each of the 10 large parishes across this large diocese. It's fascinating traveling and seeing this diverse countryside, but it was also exhausting. The training programs would run from a Thursday morning to a Saturday evening. And on a Sunday, we'd have great celebration and the giving out of certificates. They love having certificates. As a result, by early 2020, there were 39 of these discipleship groups across the diocese. The plan for 2020 was to return to each parish to give more training to the existing leaders. We wanted to develop strong groups that were well led. And from these workshops, we wanted to identify key people who would work with Reverend Florent in the future. But when COVID came to Madagascar in March, everything stopped, churches, schools, transport. So we stayed for three months and then decided to return to the UK in June. But to our great joy, Florent has been able to continue the work. In September, he used Zoom to train parish priests in the distant parishes to deliver training in their own area. And as COVID-19 restrictions have reduced, Florent has been able to carry out some local training himself. So in fact, the work has gone on further without us being there. In this discipleship work, we, we've seen the parable of the sower worked out in people's lives. We've seen some groups thrive and grow. Others have really struggled and some have died and stopped altogether. So we, we tried to puzzle out why this was. Why do some groups do well and others do badly? We just want to give you a couple of reflections. We wonder, it might even help you in your own thinking about discipleship here in this parish. So one reason why groups struggled. The first of our training programs took place in Andranavuri, the poorest of the parishes in a poor diocese. The trainees were so embarrassed because all they could offer us for lunch was some rice and some beans cooked in water, no other sauce. But they were enthusiastic about the training and 11 groups began almost immediately. But a few months later, I returned to this parish and found that they'd virtually all stopped meeting. And the reason seemed to be that many people were just too busy trying to survive. Others had become discouraged by life's hardships and others felt the pull of their local traditions keeping them away. So here's our first question for you. What are the hardships, fears, and distractions that divert you and those you would seek to disciple from a deepening relationship with Christ? But some groups are thriving. And our hope from the first was to work with a Malagasy who would continue the work after we left. And we saw qualities in Reverend Florent that proved vital for a co-worker. He has a heart for teaching, he's a team worker, reflective, utterly trustworthy, has a deep love for God and a desire to see others grow as disciples. His gifts and knowledge of the local culture were absolutely vital. But a committed co-worker isn't enough. Our experience was that where the parish priest and other local leaders owned the program, it flourished. Where it didn't, it died. Reverend Florent, in one parish, took those, oh sorry, Reverend Victor, apologies. Reverend Victor in one parish took those he had trained through the first book of the course himself, and only then when people had experienced the course as participants were they ready to lead it. 
So time invested in building good foundations gave slow but steady growth. And committed leaders were essential. So our question two, what would the commitment of Florent and Victor to discipleship look like in your situation? We're so grateful to you for your support for us, and we thank God. We also thank God for what we've shared with you, this opportunity that we've had, this privilege of disciple-making in Madagascar. But finally, Jane, as we end our service with CMS, I wonder if you'd like to share with us what you're most thankful for. One thing I'm most thankful for are the relationships that were built between us and the South Malagasy and with the South Sudanese. What we taught our work was important, but how we related to people was much more significant and lasting. Sharing in people's lives was an enormous privilege, a continuing joy, and it's an impetus for our prayers. I'm especially grateful for a special friendship with Huli, the wife of our assistant bishop. This developed through my teaching her English, our working together, teaching people to read in Malagasy, and our shared interest in nature and the environment, which expressed itself in a love of gardening. So we shared experiences, joys, concerns, and hopes, especially as wives and mothers. We discussed, lamented, and laughed together. So she is a very special dear friend and a continuing companion in prayer. And Derek, what are you thankful for? Well, like you, Jane, I treasure the friends that we made in South Sudan and Madagascar. But I want us to end by giving thanks to God for his faithfulness to us over our time abroad. I'm sure this doesn't apply to you because you know me too well, but I do think that many Christians see vicars and ministries somehow as sort of super Christians um, whose faith allows them to travel serenely through life, a bit like a boat traveling across untroubled waters. Of course, if you read St. Paul, you'll discover that that was not his experience, and it certainly uh, was not ours. We experienced overseas times of frustration, some difficult relationships, and we also felt outsiders on occasion. We didn't belong to that culture. But like St. Paul, we have found again and again that God's grace is sufficient for us. We can echo, at least in part, what St. Paul says in chapter 4, verse 13 of Philippians. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We've begun to learn, we may be slow learners, but we've begun to learn that our lives and our service, in fact, everything, doesn't in the end depend upon us, but it depends upon God. God is faithful. That's what matters. So as we all face this new challenge, new wave of COVID, whatever that might bring, let us turn towards God let us remember, God is faithful. So Jane and I want to bear witness to the faithfulness of God. In St. Paul's words in chapter 4, verse 20, to our God and Father, be glory forever and ever. Amen. We're going to hear a little bit more of this uh, lovely Malagasy music. And 
the opportunity for you to reflect on anything that we've said, maybe just one little thing, and just think of one thing that you might apply to your life in this coming week. Just one thing out of what we've said. So if Dave would play a little bit more music, a bit quieter, so people can reflect as they listen. And then I'll end with a, a, a short prayer. Let us pray. Faithful God, loving God, we thank you that you have reached down and you have touched our lives, that you love us. Your faithfulness knows no bounds. So we commend ourselves of the church in Tuliar Diocese to you. But even through this difficult time, we might know your faithfulness and your love for us. You might fill us with hope. We might even grow through this time. Deepen our lives, we pray. We might live more and more like your son, Jesus Christ. We ask these things in his name. Amen. And so we pray for our needy world, for those persecuted for their faith in you, for those caught up in various disasters, for refugees and people on the move, for the exploited, young girls sold into marriage because of the poverty of their parents, all involved in slavery, for the lonely, despairing or sad, for those who feel forgotten or unloved, and for those who do not know Jesus. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask you to have mercy <clears throat> on our world. Guide the rulers of the nations who bear heavy responsibilities of making decisions. Direct our nation as we face our share of responsibility, especially at this time of pandemic. Have mercy on us, we pray, and heal our land. 
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We thank you for enabling Derek and Jane to serve you in Madagascar and for the spread of the gospel in that island. We thank you for the discipleship training that has been started and pr pray for the Reverend Florent as he continues this work. Give him strength and discernment and the joy of seeing people getting to know you better. Thank you also for the work of the Church Mission Society, who over the years has helped people to fulfill their calling to take the good news of Jesus worldwide. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all who need you in a special way, the sick, the fearful, the hurting, those whom we name before you in the silence now. Touch them with your healing power, we pray. And may our lives be a space in which you can work, clear away our inner clutter, and fill us with your spirit of peace and joy, so that everything we do may be the fruit of your life within us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Now we join together in the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. <laughs>